Everybody, welcome to the Spring Virtual Assembly of District 5080. I am Tim Fredrickson. I am the district governor-elect, and in July, I will be governor. In the past, we have had several. Uh, everybody stand up and self-introduce themselves. That is going to be hard to do, and we have limited time, so we aren't going to do that at, at this time. In fact, we're gonna streamline things a little bit. This is our first attempt to do something like this on this scale in our district. However, for the time being and for the next several months, this looks like the way we are going to conduct business. Before we get started, I have a few thank yous to express. First, I would like to thank the AGs. Next, I would like to thank the rest of the governor line that includes Bev, Bob, Lynn, and Linda. And finally, I would like to express a most grateful thank you to Debbie Dawkins. Without her, none of this gets done. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, our first plenary speaker, and that's John Bushnell. Uh, John joined Rotary in 1987 in, in San Luis Obispo, California. Uh, I joined Rotary in 1984 in Port Angeles, Washington. So John and I are pretty much uh, uh, people who've been in Rotary a long, long time. And, uh, but since then, uh, John has been a member of two additional clubs uh, in Oregon, serving as president of both. Among other things, John has served as pets instructor, district membership chair, district trainer, district governor and also assistant rotary coordinator he has been named rotarian of the year by both his club and his district he is a member of the bequest society and is several times a paul harris fellow he is a member of the rotary club of bend oregon and i'm happy to say i consider john a friend he was here last year to talk about the core values of rotary and was such a good hit, we asked him back. Rotarians, please welcome John Bushnell. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for that gr very gracious uh, introduction. Um, you know, I, I was really looking forward to coming and visiting all of you uh, this year again, and due to this nasty pandemic, of course, that's not gonna happen. But uh, I think this is such a great thing that Tim and Debbie and everyone else that's worked on it has put together. And I'm really excited to be a part of uh, such a great innovation. As, as I'm going through my program, if, if you want to just uh, uh, jot down at the center of bottom center of your screen, you'll find the little chat icon. You can click on that and you can write in a comment or a question. I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes. And then we'll have some time afterwards where I'll answer those questions or comment on your comments. Now, all of us have some kind of a value system that we live by. Uh, we, we may not be able to put that into words. We may not be able to express exactly what that is, but it's just as simple as if some, you're in the grocery store and you see someone drop a $20 bill and, and uh, some of us will go over and pick that up and say, excuse me, ma'am, but you dropped this $20 bill. And some of us will go, oh boy, I just made $20. And that, that really is, is driven by whatever value system that you have internally that you've developed over the years. Now, when I was a little kid, there was a, a, another little kid when I was seven years old that lived down on the corner from me. And uh, his name was Stanley. And he lived in the lower bunk of a bedroom that he shared with his brother. Stanley had brittle, what we called back then brittle bone disease, and he couldn't go out and play. And every day or every, once a week, I would go over to his house after school. And we'd play Chinese checkers or shoots and ladders or something. And one day I came home from school and my mother says, well, John, it's time to you know, go down and play with Stanley. And that day, I, I just didn't want to do it. I said, Mom, I really don't want to go down and play with Stanley today. It's so boring when I go down there. And, and I'll never forget. I mean, this was back in 1959. 
she was like June Cleaver dressed in her nice dress and apron. And I'll never forget her bending over and looking at me and saying those words that every, either if you're raised Catholic or Jewish, that you heard a lot, but you hated to hear, and I was raised Catholic, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should be ashamed of yourself. You know, God has smiled on you. You get to play on the playground and ride your bicycle and run through the hills. And Stanley isn't as lucky as you are. And he can't do those things. It's your duty. He's your neighbor. It's your duty to go down and play with him and spend time with him. And that made an impression on me. I never missed another play date with Stanley after that. Uh, but what I realized looking back now, and I didn't start thinking about core values till I was probably 50 years old. But what I realized was that my mother was instilling a core value in me. And of course, when I got older, I was 1987, Tim, you mentioned, and I got invited to join this Rotary Club. What it was when I joined Rotary was a collision of my value system that I had been given and developed with the value system that Rotary has. And it was a perfect fit. It gave me an opportunity. God had smiled on me. I was living in a big house, had four kids. Uh, at that time, I was running. I didn't own restaurants, but I was running restaurants and had been very successful. And God had smiled on me and it gave me an opportunity to share that with other people. So I ran my business for, uh, I finally bought the Tumalo Feed Company uh, and started that in 1991. And I ran it for 27 years. And when I was young, I trained our employees how to do things, how to do tasks, how to serve tables, how to wash dishes, how to cook things. As I got older and smarter, I started teaching them why we do things. And I started teaching them about what I had defined at that point as our core values of our business. When I was there every day, I led the way and I was, I was living the core values of our business so that they could follow. As I got older and had more than one restaurant and pulled away a little bit, I had to find a way to instill those core values in them. Other examples of core values, a wedding, when we get married, basically what we do right there is we define a, a system of values that we're going to run our marriage by. We're not gonna put anyone else before our spouse. We're gonna love and honor our spouse. And we're gonna do that until death do we part. That's putting together a, a value system that we're gonna live in our wedding by and hope about half the people follow through on that as we know. I think the greatest example of a, of a value system and core values is an ant colony. I mean, they don't speak, they don't communicate that to each other, but somehow they know what their value system is and they're able to sacrifice and do exactly what they do to make that value system work in their colony. So when a Rotary Club is chartered, they should adopt the value system of, of Rotary. And it's what we call Rotary's core values. Now, why are Rotary's core values so important? I think that's, that's the big question. And uh, how many people, raise your hand if you, if you uh, went to college. And then raise your hand if you took Psychology 101. Okay, well, for those of you that took that Psych 101 class, you probably remember a fellow by the name of Maslow. And Maslow developed uh, what he called the hierarchy of needs. Um, and, and actually, he was a psychologist. And, and this was in the 1950s and 1960s. This was a very uh, vibrant and uh, new and, and uh, great idea that they taught and that they used. Now, this, the, the psychology world has kind of moved past this, but it's been adopted by uh, sociologists, and it's definitely been adopted in the business world. But basically, what Maslow said is that, is, and I'm just going to run over this because we probably know most of it, is that, is that there's, it's, a human need is to, is to reach our highest potential. But in order to meet our highest potential, we have this hierarchy of needs that we have to satisfy the lowest needs first 
in order to move up that pyramid. So our first needs are our physiological needs, and these are part of our basic needs. Food, warmth, water, sleep. Um, those are the very basic things we need before we can really start thinking about anything else it, to, to satisfy in our lives. Um, think about homeless people, people that are wondering where they're gonna be sleeping that tonight, have food insecurity, don't know where they're gonna be getting their next meal. They're not thinking about how can I realize my full potential as a human being. They're thinking, all they can think about is where they're gonna sleep that night and what they're gonna eat. So, so once someone has those things taken care of, then they can think, start thinking about their safety needs and their security needs. And that's, I think, when we talk about our home and our safety and our security in our life, probably our jobs um, and, and, and becoming, having a safe and a secure position in society. We can start thinking about that. So those are our basic needs. Once those are filled, we can start thinking about our psychological needs. And those are belongingness and love, being a part of something. I, I referred earlier to a wedding, being married, having someone else in our lives, a family, and that feeling of really being a part of something and having those intimate and close relationships in your life. Once you have those established, then you can start thinking about your own self-esteem. And I think this is where Rotary comes into a lot of our lives is that, that as, we're, as we're starting to fulfill those needs of self-esteem, we're building our careers, we're, we're uh, at some point our kids still love us and think we're great. Uh, that's not for their entire childhood, of course, uh, but, but we, we start thinking about those things. And, and I think the reason that that fits so well with Rotary is for a lot of us, when we join a Rotary Club, it's kind of a hallmark in our life that we're accepted into a bigger society and we are getting that good feeling about ourselves and that self-esteem by giving back. And then of course, when all this happens, then we, we reach our full potential as human beings. We're able to live really full, happy lives. So I believe that a Rotary Club, which of course we all want our Rotary Clubs to be successful, that we have a hierarchy of needs as well in Rotary. And I've kind of done these in the same way that, that, uh, that Maslow did, taking his lead. And there are foundational things about a Rotary Club. Of course, the first thing you need is you need to have a meeting place. You need to have a, a charter from Rotary. You can't be a Rotary Club without a charter. And you have to have members. I mean, those are the three things. A lot of people have said you should have a bell in there as well. But a bell, you could have a Rotary Club without a bell, but most of us don't. But so the meeting place, a rotary charter, and members are really the most foundational things that you need to get chartered. And then after that, you have rotary's core values. And the reason those are a foundational thing in rotary is that those are what define us as rotary. They're what differentiate us from every other group out there. We're not the Kiwanis. We're not the Lions Club. We're not the, the Tuesday lunch club that meets and gives away scholarships. We do that. We do that. But that's not all that we are. We're Rotary. So without adopting Rotary's core values when we get chartered and as we operate our clubs, we're not really Rotary. That's what defines us as Rotary. So once we have those foundational needs taken care of, and we are, uh, we have the meeting place and we have the members and we're meeting and we've adopted the core values. We are a Rotary Club. Then we can do those things that, that really start working towards fulfilling our goals as Rotarians and being a successful club. The first thing we do is we build relationships between members through our friendships. We establish those friendships and those relationships and, and we, we, through those friendships and through those relationships that we build, then we can start doing the things that Rotarians do. And that is, and I, these, these two things could be inter, interchanged or they could be even together. We, we start doing fundraising and then we do service projects. That's what Rotary does. If you ask what Rotary does is that we do service projects. And of course, in order to do a service project, you have to 
have effective fundraising so that you can fund those projects. So it's those relationships we build and those effective fundraising so that we can do our service projects is what takes us to that next level that is what our desired outcomes are, is where we have satisfied members in our club, they're having those friendships, they're doing their service projects, and when we have satisfied members, that I think is how we can define, define ourselves as an effective uh, and, a, and a successful Rotary Club. And I don't know, Debbie, if we're having any, any questions coming in, but we'll get to those at the end. So, for those of you that aren't familiar with Rotary's core values, and I know there's some of you out there, the question is, what are Rotary's core values? Well, let's go through them. The first one, of course, is service. And I made that, that remark earlier. Service is what we do as Rotarians. We serve others. Take Polio Plus. I mean, probably the greatest international service project ever undertaken uh, I mean, on the level of the Marshall Plan almost, that we are eradicating polio off the face of the earth and giving that gift to every child that lives in perpetuity. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that is the basis of what we do. Now, these aren't things that, that are pie in the sky. This is what we think we'd like Rotary to be. These are the things that Rotary has been for 113 or 14 years that we've been in existence. I don't know if you can all see those green lines on my screen, but those weren't there when we started. I don't know how they got there. Um, and I apologize for them. But at any rate, uh, so service is the first one, and then fellowship. And that's, I was referring to the friendships. Uh, a lot of you remember the Siegel and Gale study from about uh, probably seven or eight years ago. This is why people join Rotary. The number two reason why people join Rotary is for those friendships and fellowship. And it's the number one reason why they stay. So that's a huge component of Rotary. And I think for most of us, if you look around your own Rotary Club and you think about Rotary, really, that's a huge component of your membership in Rotary, is all those friends uh, that you have. I mean, I look around, uh, when I think about like who, who fixes my car, who I bank with, who my insurance agent is, they're all people that I've met through Rotary and established those friendships and relationships with who I, that I can trust. And then the next one, the next core value, there are five in total, is leadership. And of course, in past days in Rotary, you had to be a, a business owner or a professional or a, a, a leader in your community in order to even be asked to join Rotary. And uh, and we see that now as being exclusive, uh, as, as, and exclusive is a good word when you're talking about country clubs, but it's really a bad word when you're talking about service clubs. We were excluding an awful lot of people with the hearts of Rotarians. And now, of course, we're being more inclusive and in saying that if you have the heart of a Rotarian and you want to serve, you can, you can serve and you can be a Rotarian. But leadership is, and I see that, Tim, Leadership is, is a part of our DNA. It's about who we are and what we've done in the past. So even if, even if a person comes into Rotary now and isn't a top leader in their community, they should be learning those leadership principles in the clubs and as a Rotarian, because it's a vital part of, of who we are. And like I said, in, in our very DNA. And then next is integrity. And there's just one thing I can say about, about our core value of integrity to make it come home to everybody, and that is the four-way test. I mean, every Rotarian, we love our four-way test. We recite it before meetings, we have it on our desks, we have it on the walls in our office, and, and what, it, what else is that except our statement of our integrity? So integrity, has always been a huge part of Rotary. In fact, there used to be a, 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 an actual statement of, of, of our, our integrity as business people and in the community that was adopted, I think, in the 1930s by, by uh, the RI, at the RI convention. And for some reason in the early 60s, uh, they, they, they unadopted it as, a, as a, an official document. 
but the, but the concept lives on is that we are people of integrity and it's it's i think i think i'm looking at everyone here and i think we're all very proud that we belong to an organization that integrity is such a huge part of so the last one of our core values is diversity and of course when we first think about diversity we think about gender diversity or age diversity or ethnic diversity and those are those are popular buzzwords now but also and those are important to our rotary clubs now I mean, i really believe that that a rotary club should reflect the diversity that's in its community uh, and i think that's that's always a great goal for every rotary club to be reflecting their community in terms of diversity but again when i say this isn't like a pie in the sky thing this is what we'd like to be this is who we are and i can i can bring that home by saying to think about about vocational diversity I mean, hasn't that always been a part of rotary about in our rotary clubs in order to be stronger we want to have a, a diverse group in terms of vocations because we all have something different through our vocations and vocational service to bring to the club so those are the five core values of Rotary. Again, not the pie in the sky stuff, but this is who we are and who we've been. I mean, when you look at the service aspect, I mean, we've gone so far as to actually define our five avenues of service. You look at the integrity aspect, like I said, we've gone so far as to define through the four-way test how our value system around that integrity part piece works. So these are the things hopefully that we adopt as Rotarians and, and as our Rotary Club. And I think that if, if we take a look at our own Rotary Clubs, and I know that everyone here is, is, a, is a leader in your club. Everyone here is a Rotary leader. And I think you define yourself that way by saying, I'm not just someone that comes into the meeting every week and says hi to Joe and hi to Sue and has my lunch or has my breakfast and then I go off, back off and I don't think about Rotary again until next week when I go to my meeting. By attending this meeting today, you're defining yourself as someone who thinks about Rotary on a little larger scale than just those club meetings that you go to every week. And I think that as Rotary leaders, that we need to be looking at our own clubs and, and within our district to say, are we really living these Rotary's core values? Are, are we reflecting these values in our clubs? And you know, Debbie was a part, Debbie Dawkins was a part of a, of a group that we did in Reno. We brought in people from 23 districts um, to take a look at how can we strengthen our clubs and strengthen our membership by, by helping our clubs get closer to those core values that made Rotary such a success and a, and a more than just a, a, a service club, it was a, it was a social movement for many, many years. And I believe it still is in the world. It's a movement, not, not just a club. So um, as, as leaders, I think you can take a look at these things in your own clubs and say, what can we do to, to highlight and make our members aware of how we can live integrity and diversity and do more service and have better friendships and all those things. And I guarantee you from the, from the experiments that we've done and the work that we've done over the last three years, it will strengthen your club, it'll strengthen your district, and as a result, it'll strengthen Rotary. So two things that I'd really like you to take away from this today. I mean, what I just said, I think is really, really important. But another thing is to remember that, that these core values are what differentiate us from every other organization and every other group. I mean, I think I'm looking out and I'm seeing people with rotary backgrounds and wearing rotary shirts. I mean, I think we're all pretty proud of being Rotarians. And, and it's, 
you know, why are we proud of being Rotarians? It's not just because we have a cool logo. It's not just because we have a lot of gear that we can wear. It's because of these values that we have as Rotarians. That's what makes us proud and want to say to people, I am a Rotarian. So, so I think if there's one of two things you can really take away from this is that, is that these core values are so important because they're what define us as Rotary. And the next thing is to remember that, that the, the, the core values are really the foundation of the house that we're, that we're built on. Um, that those are the things that in, in the very early days, I mean, Paul Harris started Rotary for friendship. He was, he was from a small town and moved to Chicago and he missed that camaraderie and that closeness that you have in a small town. So he recreated it with three of his friends and said, we're gonna to meet together at each other's offices. We'll switch every week, we'll meet at another, each other's office. And, and they switched every week. That's why it's called Rotary Club because they rotated through their offices. But it was started for friendship. So these are the very things that are foundational to, to our organization. A Couple things that I'd like to think about going into the future is how is this pandemic going to change Rotary? Um, in, in every case of, of, and this sounds horrible, but where there have been mass deaths in, in North America, the, the, the Civil War, the Spanish flu, which, which swept through Canada and the US, uh, World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War, every time there were mass deaths, there were permanent changes in society as a result of, the, of that era or that period. I think the one that we can all relate to the most right now is 9-11. I mean, that changed those two planes flying into the, the, the Twin Towers and the third one into the Pentagon changed how we live in many, many ways. And this pandemic is going to do the same thing. We don't know how yet. I mean, I think we, I, I talked to one group in Rotary and they say, I think this is going to kill our membership. I think people are going to not go to Rotary for two or three months and then they're going to say, why am I spending this money? I go to another group and they say, oh my gosh, this is going to help us so much because we're attracting members through these Zoom meetings and we're learning new ways to communicate and new ways to, to relate to, to new members. So I think just like the pandemic itself, just like COVID-19, we don't really know how this is going to play out in Rotary. But we do know that it's going to change the face of how we operate. And it's being talked about at the club level, at the district level, at the zone level, and at the RI level. It's, it's the main topic of conversation right now. So I think that's something we need to be aware of and start thinking about. We're hearing a lot of clubs saying, we're, ne we're, we're going to never go away from doing Zoom. We may do one meeting a month by Zoom. We may Zoom every meeting, every live meeting we have, but Zoom it. So just this is going to change the way we're doing things. And then the other question I have is, is as we change in Rotary, and Rotary's changed incredibly over the last, well, how long, Tim, have we been in? Uh, 30 plus years. I mean, it, it, there's a different face of Rotary now than there was when I joined. It certainly has changed. But the, but the challenge that we have ahead of us, and that I'd like to, to give you all this challenge, is to say that, that as Rotary changes in these ways that right now we can't even foresee, is how can we still make sure that we're living these core values in our club? For instance, the friendship aspect or the fellowship aspect. If we're meeting on Zoom, how are we developing all these close friendships that are so vital to us working together to achieve the goals that we want to achieve. So, I mean, there are going to be some real challenges ahead of us in how we maintain ourselves as Rotary and, and keep living these core values with the changes that are going to be uh, coming up in the, in the very near future. So, um, hopefully I've 
spurred some thoughts in you for going forward and going back to your clubs and, and maybe sharing some of this. And just even internally as, as a Rotarian, thinking about how can I, how can I live a life that's closer to Rotary's core values and how can I help my club live uh, an existence that's closer to Rotary's core values. So that's the end of my presentation. And uh, again, thank you so much for inviting me, Debbie and Tim. Uh, I, I wish I could have been up there. I have so many friends in your district and I, I miss seeing you all in person, uh, although I'm seeing a lot of you right now. Um, and uh, hopefully next year we'll be able to do that. So Debbie, at this point, I think, should we open it up for questions and comments? Absolutely, John, thank you so much. Um, I was inspired by you when I met you at Zone and learned from you in those classes. Um, we've had you now at last year's assembly and this year's, and once again, picking up new ideas, new thoughts, processes, new ways to, to be a Rotarian. So thank you for that, it's very inspiring. There are a couple questions over here um, and some comments too. Uh, let me move back up because people are putting them in. Um, how can we as club members adopt these to our clubs is one question. And then later down um, in the questions, the same question, how do the core values inform our focus of foundation membership and public image? So maybe combine those two questions on how we bring it back to the club and how we use that um, for our main areas of focus for this Rotary year. Great, 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 great pair of questions. Um, first, uh, in answer to the, to the first part of that, uh, you know, I, I think that that awareness uh, and keeping the core values at top of mind is the best way to, to, to get those going in your club. Interestingly, in some of the focus groups we've had on this, uh, and Debbie was in one of these focus groups, and I think it might have even been her group that came up with this idea. Um, with, you know, probably a lot of you out there were unaware that their Rotary even had core values. And so you're going, wow, uh, you know, this is amazing. And it, it, it strikes, it rings a bell with you because you, you recognize it. So, so the focus group's idea was every club has the four-way test, a banner for the four-way test up you know, near the podium or on the wall somewhere. And why not have another banner with the five core values? These are rotaries, these are our core values. So that, so that you're reminding Rotarians in your club every week that these are our core values. And of course, having it spoken about from the podium by the president, by, by club members as they're up uh, is another way. You know, Keeping things at top of mind in your club is how you want to accomplish anything, whether it's, it's foundation giving. If you mention it, foundation giving in the first meeting of the year and say, our goal is $10,000, and you never talk about it again for the whole year, at the end of the year, the la the, at the last meeting, you're going to say, well, we didn't reach our goal. But if you're talking about it constantly, so, so how how we might bring that focus into the, those different areas. Uh, I, I think that, for instance, and I'll use foundation giving again as, a, as, a, as an example, that service is, is one of our core values. And, and without funds to do that service, whether on a local level or on an international level, we can't do that service. So that, that, that core value of service is what should compel us to give to the foundation so that we can do that service both locally and internationally. Um, uh, with membership, I, to me, that's probably the most compelling and obvious thing is that I believe that as an organization, if we were living the core values. If as clubs, we were exemplifying those core values and talking about them and, and aware of them, that, that everyone would want to be a part of Rotary. Who doesn't want to be a part of an organization that has integrity, diversity, does service, make, you make friends? I mean, who doesn't want to be a part of that? So, so it works on 
it, it works with all that. And you know, it's, it's interesting with branding. Uh, I think it is our brand. I mean, I, I think that is our brand. I think it's at the most basic level, that's our brand. And if we brand ourselves as those things, we do service, we make friends, uh, we're, we have diversity, then that's, that's good public image, I think. Mm -hmm. Great answer, John, thank you. I just wanted to share with you some of the comments um, since you can't uh, read the chat and talk at the same time. And uh, when it comes to youth, uh, one of our members said, I think we're getting better at recognizing these core values in our youth and providing the best spring forward possible for them to become self-aware and grow within the rotary continuum. Our work seems to draw this out in our youth and gives them opportunities to shine. So I do think by embracing these core values and bringing them up into the forefront of what we do as Rotarians, we're making a difference with our youth. Another comment is, we also need to share with our communities at large that these are our values, just as you said. Show the folks around us by our behavior that we are much more than a business or a service club. Otherwise, we are hidden in plain sight. Uh, another question down here, wait for it. How do the core about, oh, we got that one. So the next comment is, I think there is a great opportunity to use Rotary to refocus on our communities and community good and away from polarized tribalism, but it will require advocacy and speaking out of our values. And I think they will find them an attractive alternative. And then another comment that maybe you could address is, I'm not sure how familiar um, we are all, all are yet with Toastmasters, but Lynn made a comment that some of their core values are similar to what we're doing with Rotary, which is probably why we teamed up with them. So are you aware of any of that and what their core values are in relation to the core values here with us as Rotarians? You know, I'm, I'm not really uh, familiar with their organization other than I'm aware that we are uh, teaming with them, but but I'd like to go back to the previous comment uh, and say that that's just such a uh, uh, right on kind of comment. I mean, we're living in this world now where we just I, what was the term you used? The polarized tribalization, uh, where just everything is like people take sides on every single thing, and and in Rotary. You know, we don't do that. We, we, we don't have borders. We don't have religion. We don't have politics. And, and I think we're pretty good at living that, that ideal that we're all, we all have the same values and we all have the same goals and all that other stuff is, is in other parts of our life. And I, I, I wish the world could be a little bit more like Rotary in that respect. Thank you. So basically the comments that I'm seeing on here are all um, bravo and we agree and we need to walk our talk. Um, Deborah Ford talked about that she's president of the Lake Ponderay Toastmasters Club here and she um, also talks about the overlapping core values. I think when Lynn was putting the core values out there they were um, Sorry, there's just an awful lot of com comments. Integrity, respect, and service. They add excellence, we add leadership and fellowship. So um, we do have those opportunities to come together as a community um, with them. So um, those are the final comments that I have down here. John, do you have any closing comments before Mr. Fredrickson thanks you formally for your time and efforts with District 5080 today? Actually, I'm, I'm glad you asked, Debbie, because I do. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the leadership element of, of Rotary and, and um, talk about how we might build a culture of leadership in our clubs. You know, leadership, I think that's a, a big challenge for Rotary right now. Both, you know, how many, how many people have the thing, well, have heard, well, I'm only president of my club because I missed a meeting. You know, I hear that constantly. I'm, I'm real involved in, in our Pacific Northwest pets. And we ask presidents, you know, why, why did you become president? And there's half of them sometimes will come up with some kind of a joke. I missed a meeting or, a, you know, a, 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 there was nine other people in my club or there's nine other people in my club and they were all in prison, something like that. And, and to me, that's not exhibiting a, a, a 
culture of leadership in the clubs. And a lot of clubs are having trouble finding presidents, finding committee chairs. So I think we also need to be thinking about how we build that culture of leadership in our clubs. And, and I, I think there's, I mean, we've done workshops around this as well, um, about, about building that culture of leadership. And it starts with the, with the current leadership. It starts with talking about leadership. And it, and, it, and it starts with an awareness, a certain awareness of, of, of leadership within the club and of teaching leadership. I joined Rotary when I was in my early 30s. And, and um, I learned a lot of my leadership and a lot of things that I applied in my family, in my business that I learned through being a member of Rotary. And I think that we, we, it would help us to focus on that is if we're not, and I, I made a reference to it earlier, if we're, if we're not attracting only leaders, we should, we should at least be aware that we have a responsibility to teach leadership to our members and to, to, to live those leadership principles. So I think that's an important thing that I'd add. Thank you, John. Appreciate your time and effort today. Tim, Thank you. any closing remarks before we close this session and move on to our nine o'clock? I would just like to thank John for uh, his remarks for doing this last year, but especially for coming back and doing it this year. And, and particularly under the, the situation and conditions that we are in. It is always timeless to hear you talk, John, and, and especially about the core values. And I wanna thank you very, very much for that. I have uh, a gift for you, uh, but it's not, it, it's not <laughs> where you're at, so I will, uh, uh, it's a, a nice bottle of Cabernet, and uh, I hope you enjoy that when uh, uh, when next we meet. I'll make sure that I that I have that with me. So, uh, thank you very much. And and actually, uh, John, thank you very much for for being with us today. And I hope you stick around. I plan on it. <laughs> oh, very good. All right, very good. All right, well, that ends our eight o'clock meeting. Um, applause, applause, applause for John Bushnell. And thank you, Tim. And I will end this meeting now. And please go check.